So today is the first webinar in our new webinar series for 2021, focusing specifically on sterile barrier systems. There are four webinars in the series, and of course these are hosted, brought to you kindly by SAFMED. SAFMED has been your solutions provider for over 30 years, not only in the CSD, which you know us well for, but also in the operating real environment. Thank you very much, SAFMED, for sponsoring this. Right, as I just said, there are four webinars in this series. They'll be hosted on Thursday mornings between 11 and 11.45 on the 14th of October, being today, the 21st of October, the 28th of October, and then again on the 4th of November. In today's webinar, we'll focus on what is a sterile barrier system. In webinar two, we'll take a sneak peek, and it's, it is truly an insider look because I don't think anybody has shared this kind of information before on how sterile barrier systems are made and a few pictures around how they do that, as well as some of the testing methods. And we've got um, um, some really nice in-depth knowledge that I don't think too many people are aware of on how we test the products. In webinars three and four, we'll focus more on how we actually use sterile barrier systems. And of course, we'll be covering uh, wraps, containers, all sorts of sterile barrier systems. How are we using them? Are we using them correctly? Are we following um, um, the guidelines in terms of the standards, in terms of how we use them, not just how they're made? Uh, webinar three falls in the same week as Africa Health. So Africa Health runs that whole week, but um, our session, the CSSD session, is on the Wednesday the 27th which is why we're having our training on Thursday so that we don't clash with that. With that, Of course, Africa Health is free. You can go ahead and register. If you don't have the links, let me know. I can register for you. Um, the video recordings will be made available as far as I understand afterwards. We're just going to confirm for how long they'll be available for. If I recall last year, they were available for about a month, but I will, I'm still waiting for confirmation around that. Um, and then, of course, uh, we'll do webinar four in um, November the 4th. So thank you kindly for, jo for joining us. Today's session, I think, is interesting. I've put together slides um, over the last couple of days on things that I'd, I've never actually created presentations around before. It's been really, really interesting putting it together and um, and looking really, really deeply at, at the standards and having the opportunity to share this information. So we'll talk about what is a sterile barrier system and kind of a what it isn't. What does it do? What are the various types of sterile barrier systems? Which one do I use for what purpose and how do I know which one to use? Uh, we'll also look at the requirements of a sterile barrier system and a little section on storage, um, how to actually store the materials. If I'm asked a question around sterile barrier systems, generally the first port of call I'm going to go to is the ISO standard, ISO 11607. And ISO 11607 was updated in 2019. Uh, there are a few of us on the call, uh, or at least certainly uh, Roger who's on the call, has direct access to um, as a committee meetings and forms part of these standard creations and it is really really important because, because we get direct and immediate feedback around what is happening with all of our standards which is awesome and gives us uh, in-depth knowledge. ISO 11607 Part 1, as you can see, covers the requirements for the materials that we use to make sterile barrier systems. It recovers the requirements of sterile barrier systems themselves once they are now formed um, and packaging systems as a whole. Part 2 is all around the validation requirements for forming and sealing, also a very important part of sterile barrier systems, and we will talk around that as we go through the various webinars as well. Then, of course, what matters is what are the South African national standards? So, ISO 11607 Part 1, the 2019 version, that update, was adopted in South Africa, SANS 11607 Part 1, in 2020. 
So please note that that standard is available on the South African National Bureau of Standards website. Um, you can purchase them. Of course, we can't share them. As you know, they're all licensed documents. If ever you needed to understand them, if you're involved in the procurement or the decision making about these kind of products, then it would be a standard that would be very important for you to have a copy of so that you have an in-depth knowledge of these particular products. What does ISO 11607 tell us about a sterile barrier system? So it clearly states that a sterile barrier system is the minimum packaging required, of course, that minimizes the risk of the ingress of microorganisms, so it prevents the ingress of microorganisms into the pack, and at the same time allows for aseptic presentation of the sterile contents at the point of use. And I think it's very important to realize that it's not just about the sterile barrier system, it's about how it ends up being put together as a whole that it, it can be presented aseptically. Of course, aseptic presentation we know is the transfer of sterile contents from its sterile barrier system using conditions and procedures that minimize the risk of microbial contamination. So how we open it matters, of course. Therefore, how we pack it in such a manner that we are able to open it becomes very important. Again, parts we will go into more and more in depth as we go along with our series. In the introduction section of the standard, it is a long, lengthy standard, and remember, it deals mostly with uh, this particular one, uh, how it is the product is being manufactured, the, um, the parameters it needs to comply with. Again, we'll go a little bit more deeper into that, probably more in webinar two. And um, lovely, lovely standard. But right in the beginning in the introduction, it speaks to these following things that really resonated with me. The process of designing and developing a packaging system for terminally sterilized medical devices is complicated and it's a critical endeavor. And it's very valid and a point we have to remember. The device components, the packaging system should all combine to create a sterile medical device at the end of the day that performs efficiently, safely and effectively. And note effectively in the hands of the user. Of course, terminal sterilization and sterility maintenance are essential for patient safety irrespective of the facility that conducts these processes. So we're at the, end, at the end of the line, we use them in the operating room, we use these sterile barrier systems in the CECSD department where we are creating the packaging, and please, it is hell of a important, it really is a critical endeavor. So wrapping a set is, is not child's play, it's an important concept because it has a consequence. We all know that in low and middle income countries that more than one in 10 people who have surgery end up with surgical site infections. And of course, a sterile barrier system can play a really important role in preventing surgical site infections. So what we do and what we don't do can affect our patient's safety. Sterile barrier systems need to do a few things, and this is just a few of them we're starting with. Number one, it needs to allow for sterilization. And what does that mean? It means that we need to be able to get the air that's in a package out. We need to be able to get the sterilant, the steril, sterilant to penetrate within the packaging and to do its job to sterilize. It needs to provide some form of physical protection and there are a number of things we can discuss around that. It needs to maintain the sterility until the point of use, and the packaging needs to be lint-free, or at the very least, low linting. Sterile barrier systems are divided into three main broad categories. Wrapping materials, which we know well, pre-formed sterile barrier systems and reusable sterile barrier systems. I've given you some images on the right of the screen that are examples of pre-formed sterile barrier systems. And that of course is defined as a sterile barrier system that is supplied partially assembled for filling 
and final closure or sealing. Interestingly, these are sterile barrier systems that are used uh, normally on single use devices. They're not the ones we use in the CECD, but we certainly do open large volumes of these types of sterile barrier systems in the operating rooms to use on our patients. One example is the form, fill and seal type of sterile barrier system. In this particular system, the machine manufactures the sterile barrier system by forming the bottom web. Uh, then you fill the web with the device and then you apply the top web and you seal that sterile barrier system. An example is this is often used the form full and seal, often used for syringes, for example. The four side sealing process, it normally uses a rotary sealing piece of equipment to do the sealing and it requires sealing in all four seams. It's generally used for um, single use devices like gloves and wound care products. If you think about it, that is also a sterile barrier system. And the manufacture of these sterile barrier systems are all covered in the same standard that we've now discussed, 11607. So the ones we use in the hospital settings and the ones that are used by manufacturers all covered in the same standard and must comply with the basic requirements. Containers, of course, are also a sterile barrier system. They are a form of sterile barrier system. And here I've taken some extracts directly out of ISO 11607 part one. Reusable containers are constructed of metals and synthetic materials because I'm sure you've seen some made of um, different polymers that uh, look more plastic-like. They are made of materials that are capable of withstanding repeated exposure to hospital sterilization cycles. Containers typically have matched tops and bottoms and quite important that we keep the matched bottoms and tops the tops and bottoms that we know which goes with which. And of course, in there is a gasket and that gasket provides an impervious seal between the two parts. And that gasket is a very critical part to a container. And in webinar three and four, we'll go through what the standards say about managing our containers, how we should be validating them, testing them and checking them, of course, including that gasket because it's a crucial part of the system. Devices sterilized in containers can require specific preconditioning or longer exposure time to ensure that the sterilization process is complete. And hopefully if we are using containers, we've applied those principles as we are meant to, as it says in the standard. A sterilization bag, an example of one being in a septa bag. A sterilization bag is constructed from a single web of porous medical grade paper. It's folded to form a long tube. Of course, you can be uh, provided with or without gussets. If, if there is a gusset in something, it makes the bag um, able to open wider so you can put a bigger, uh, a broader item into it. The tube is sealed along its length by a double line of adhesive. The tube is then cut to the required size. One end is sealed. Uh, by applying again some adhesive and of course additional folds may be used for further strengthening the closure. That's when we close it, remember, corner, corner, fold over, fold over, fold over. We, um, the open end sometimes has a lip on it to make it easier for you to facilitate uh, ease of opening. And the final closure of the bag is applied prior to sterilization. So we put the item in the bag, fold over the curlers and apply the final closure, of course, in the CCD. A peel pouch or a steri reel or a flexible peel pouch is typically constructed of a film on the one side and a paper or non-woven material on the other side. Pouches are typically supplied as uh, pre-formed barriers where the, all the seals have been formed, where three of the seals has been formed except for one if it's a pouch. And then of course in a reel format, two of the side seals have been formed. We then cut the reel to the uh, desired length that we require fill the item and seal the two sides.
sterilization wrap. Again, these are quotes directly from the ISO standard. As it says over there, sterilization wrap is used to provide a sterile barrier system for many devices sterilized in healthcare facilities. Instead of forming a heat or an adhesive seal, the wrapping and the folding process provides a tortuous path that maintains sterility. And that folding process is what we'll cover in webinars three and four. Devices are typically contained in organizing instrument trays prior to wrapping and subsequent sterilization. So that tortuous path, the folding matters. It's said in the beginning, of the standard, it's a critical endeavor. How we do this really and truly does matter. Sterile barrier system types we refer to as wrap, preformed, and reusable. In the CSSD setting, generally speaking, we are going to see wrap, of course, we are going to see plastic paper reels, mostly, and in some departments we'll see plastic paper pouches. We will see paper bags and we will see containers. Let's take a deeper look at the three different types of wrapping materials or materials used to create wrap. Wrap, as you know, and I am referring specifically to this type of single-use wrap, should only be used once. A few years ago in our country, and I hope like hell it's not happening anymore, we went through the phase of cutting the corner of the wrap and therefore we would reuse it and then cut the corner and reuse it and cut the corner and after we'd cut all four corners, we would discard it. Please note, it is a single use product. You do not know what the properties of the wrap are after three or four sterilization processes. And of course, you'll never know if it has been contaminated because certain contaminants are not visible to the naked eye. Single use wrap is single use. They are made of three types of materials. Crepe, and crepe is paper. Wet laid non-woven and SMS materials. Let's take a little look at those now. Crepe, if you have a look at the image on the right, there's a micron, um, a micro, no, electron microscope image. That's a hard word to say. It takes a, a nice look at what the fibers look like. Crepe is bulky. It's a tough barrel, bacterial barrel. It is non-slippery uh, for the operator. It's relatively gentle on the hands if you're using the sensitive version. If you're not using the sensitive version, it is a little tougher to manage. It's made of a 100% cellulose material, which is paper. It is less linting than cotton, but not as low linting as some of the other products. Paper generally is designed to be able to go through the following sterilization processes. Steam, ethylene oxide, formaldehyde, and irradiation techniques. Of course, irradiation and gamma beams, etc., we don't use in the hospital setting, but they are used for bulk um, bulk items that are supplied to us. The wet laid non-woven, again you can see the image of the um, of the actual materials on the right. It's really really strong material, it's very flexible, it's very soft, so it's a soft bacterial barrier. It's low linting, an important concept. It's made from a combination of things, so there is paper in there, cellulose, there are polyester materials in there, there are binders that help bind all of these materials together, and some repellents chemicals. So at one point, um, uh, you may have been aware of the fact that some of these um, products will repel moisture, for example, or low surface tension liquids. Wet laid non-wovens can be used with steam sterilization, with ethylene oxide, with formaldehyde, and with irradiation techniques. Of course, over the last few years, there's been a big move towards using SMS-based sterile barrier materials, especially in the wrap format. And SMS materials are made of three layers. And those three layers generally will be a spun bond material layer, 
a melt blown layer, and then a spun bond material again. The spun bond is the larger fibers, and those larger fibers provide the material strength. The melt blown, you can see in the image on the right, are green in color. They're the smaller fibers, and they're the fibers that create the microbial barrier protection by creating a tortuous path within the material. There's really a nice video on the Sterile Barrier Association's website that explains the tortuous path created within the wrap. I'm not talking about the folds, I'm talking about within the actual material itself now. And that tortuous path's job is to provide a bacterial and a fluid barrier. Again, a very low linting material. Designed for steam, ethylene oxide, formaldehyde, and hydrogen peroxide based sterilizing systems. And that, of course, examples typically in the South African setting would be perhaps a VPRO or sterad. Okay, so which one do I use? And you would have applied a lot of logic in terms of which one you use in your hospital setting, but let's see what the standard says. The standard says it's very important to note that there is an interrelationship that influences the choice of the appropriate materials, and that includes the medical device itself, the sterilization process you're going to use, and the packaging system's design. And if you think about that, that includes thinking of what? The nature of the device. Am I a manufacturer and I'm making gloves? Because if I'm that kind of manufacturer, then I'm probably going to go for that four, four filled or four seamed type of sterile barrier system. If I'm a CSSD and I'm re-sterilizing, often obviously re-sterilizing single, uh, not single use devices, hopefully, uh, reusable devices, what type of barrier systems am I going to use and what do I have to seal them with? If it's a tray of instruments, it's potentially heavy. I need something that can withstand that weight. If it's a light handle, it's something light and it might be used quite quickly. I need something that's suitable for that type of item. If it's a single packed instrument, I want to be able to see what that instrument looks like. That's why I pack it separately. I need to look inside. So maybe I need a steri reel or a, um, something that I can see through. The sterilization method obviously is quite relevant because I need to know that the material I'm using is suitable for the type of sterilization method. The intended use of the product, am I using it in the operating room? Am I using it in the ward? Am I using um, a dressing pack in the ward? Am I, am I doing mouth care with this particular dressing pack? Or am I using it in the operating room on a, um, a tray of instruments? How will it be transported? So how rigorous does it need to be? Is it going to travel from here to overseas? Is it going to travel from one department to the next? Or is it going to travel from my CECD to my operating room just down the corridor? And how will it be stored? How long is it going to be stored for? Is it a light handle that I'm going to use up in a day or two and therefore um, perhaps in the scepter bag would be sufficient? Or is it something that's going to need to sit on the shelf stored for a lengthy period of time? And that matters. And all of those things together will help me make the decision on what it is I'm going to use. In the World Health Organization guidelines, there's actually a really nice chart that helps you make these decisions. It goes through a few examples in a bit more detail. In the World Health Organization's uh, Decontamination and Reprocessing of Medical Devices Guideline, they also talk about storage of packing materials. And they specifically state that packaging materials should be stored at room temperature between 18 and 22 degrees with a relative humidity of between 35 and 70 percent. Okay. Because that temperature and humidity affects the material itself, then you need that to maintain the integrity of the product. Packaging materials should not be stored adjacent to external walls or other surfaces. So the materials themselves, and of course, they would also apply to a final um, uh, packaged device or sterilized device. Um, because, as you can see, if it's stored next to a wall or an air with lower temperature or higher temperature, it may affect the ambient temperature in the storeroom. Packaging materials should be stored on shelves at least 28 centimeters above the floor. 
and packaging materials should be rotated to ensure that it doesn't exceed its shelf life when we do the first in first out principle. And of course, did you think about the outer packaging? Sometimes um, we deliver um, uh, uh, sterile barrier systems or large amounts of wrap are delivered to your unit in outer packaging. Uh, it's come on the truck, it's come through the CCD, it's come through the storeroom and pharmacy. Do you just leave all of that packaging on or do you take off that packaging before you bring it into the clean side of the CSSD? A thing you need to think about. And where do you store that stuff? Do you throw it on the floor in a pile? Have you got it on a shelf somewhere? Is it in a storeroom? Is it in a warm area? Is it somewhere at the back of the autoclaves? Where do you store your materials? Because that really is important. Okay, covering the requirements of a sterile barrier system. So we use sterile barrier systems, of course, for different tasks, as we know. But when we talk about the requirements for it, the first thing we talk about is ISO 11607 standard compliance. Is this barrier material compliant to the standard? An important thing to remember, though, is that that standard only gives you the minimum requirements. So not all materials are equal. So it's the very least you're expecting, is it compliant with that standard? So if I'm trying to make the decision about which sterile barrier system we're going to use in our hospital or our hospital group, I'm going to start with, does it comply with the standard, number one. Then I'm going to ask for the performance and the outcomes of the tests and the laboratory findings of that particular product. And I want to compare the product to the, to the standard. Did it actually comply as it's meant to? What does it mean to comply with? And I might compare it again to the product I'm currently using or other products if I want to make a decision between three or four different products. What is the actual performance? And remember, I need to compare apples with apples. So I need to compare a crepe with a crepe, an SMS with an SMS, because they are different. And they will be different in terms of their germ proofness, their strength, um, uh, their, uh, their hydro head, for example, their burst strength. They all are different. So it's A, you need to compare that you're thinking about that you're comparing a, um, a crepe with a crepe or an SMS with an SMS, firstly. And then also you need to figure out what are the most important attributes for you. Because I might have a product that is still compliant with the standard, it's a crepe, but it may not have the best germ proofness or it may not have the best strength to it. Um, and unless I've actually understood the comparison between the lots, I'm not going to know which one's which. Then I'm going to want to get it to perform in the field and to see how it works in the field. Bear in mind, though, that the products are all available in different grammages often. Certainly in SMSs, you can get a 37 gram, you can get a 43 gram, and they are going to perform differently, both in terms of all their outcomes and their germ proofness and their barrier protection and their strength, as well as in the field, their performance in terms of how they're going to handle, depending on the grammage. Of course, the lower the grammage, the more cost effective the product is. In the CSSD setting, we don't always get the opportunity to choose what grammage we get. Sometimes we get the grammage that we are given and we now need to work with it. Sometimes that's difficult. Dealing with, uh, again, the World Health Organization guidelines. Now, the information covered in here is also in ISO 11607. They just had it nicely together in one format, so I used this particular extract from the World Health Organization's guidelines. Packaging materials must be validated for the method of sterilization used. So you must know that when you order it and you buy it, that it can go through the systems that it's meant to go through. Again, the lab results will tell you that. It must contain no toxic ingredients or dyes, so the quality of the material. It must be capable of withstanding high temperatures. It must allow for air removal from the packages and from the contents within the package. It must permit the sterilant contact with the package contents. It must permit drying of the package and the contents. It must prevent the entry of micro, microorganisms. It must prevent the entry of dust and moisture during storage and handling. There must be some form of tamper-proof seal. It must be capable of withstanding normal handling, resistant to tears or puncture, punctures, and allow for aseptic presentation. 
Right, withstanding normal handling. Now that's quite a broad topic because in all honesty, we all handle our stuff really differently. For me, it's absolutely fascinating when I go from one department to the next or one hospital to the next that are using exactly the same sterile barrier systems. In some hospitals, they can um, um, manage and handle uh, the material and heavy sets and be fine with it. And then in other departments, they have exactly the same weight set, they have exactly the same sterile barrier system, but for some reason it constantly tears at that particular uh, particular site. And of course, there are a number of different reasons for that, including handling and the condition of the tray, um, the trays itself, and, and, and the condition of the, um, of the perhaps the autoclave trolley, of the shelves that it's being put on, and who's doing the handling, who's doing the heavy lifting. How you, when you're preparing the sets and you're actually busy wrapping them, how do you stack them before you transport them, put them onto the onto the um, sterilized uh, carriage of the autoclave? If they put on top of each other and there's a lot of weight, you'll get tearing at that point. And that's one of the things I've observed. How we take them off the shelf, how the scrub staff take them off the shelf, how the CCT supervisor, manager, and individual staff member handles that pack when you handle it. Because if you handle it where it's really hot, it's, you know, you sort of grab it a bit and then you drop it and throw it in certain directions. We don't always teach scrub staff how to handle the sets properly. Um, if you're tugging on the corners to pull off a heavy device, if you put it on a, on a high shelf, um, it becomes harder to manage. So very important. Capable of withstanding normal handling, resistant to tears and punctures, and allowing for aseptic presentation. World Health Organization also says, of course, it should be cost effective. And that's a, a, a toss up that you go with cost effective grammage handling. What do you need? And of course, important that you follow the manufacturer's instructions for use for the product that you have on hand. And what are those? Do you have them? Do you have a copy of them? You should. Talking about linen, and linen in the CCC in the operating room can be used for a variety of things or is used for a variety of things. Doesn't mean it should be, but it is. It can or has been used as a sterile barrier system. It can or has been used for protection around or with a sterile barrier system, or it can or is used for draping a patient, for draping a trolley or draping of equipment. We will, at one point in our four webinars, discuss the importance and the difference between a trolley drape or an equipment drape and a sterile barrier system, because in the South African setting for many, many years, we have used our sterile barrier systems as trolley drapes and sometimes in fact as patient traps. But there are different standards for these products and for these materials. So we need to understand the difference between them and what sterile barrier systems are designed for and what they are not designed for. So we will cover that as well in one of our webinars. If you're using your sterile barrier system as a wrap, so as one of your two layers or your minimum two layers, then you need to ask yourself, is it performing like a sterile barrier system should? And in webinar two, so next week, we will look at the test results, comparing a piece of crepe material, a piece of SMS material, and a piece of linen from South Africa that was uh, testing that was done in a laboratory in Europe. And we and this, the specific testing that was done was that on the germ proofness. So we'll share the results of those tests in webinar two. If you're using uh, linen now for protection, remember to ask yourself, why are you needing to use linen for protection? And the first question, of course, is what is the weight of your instrument tray? So World Health Organization guidelines and many other guidelines remind us of the fact that your, your packaging, the weight of your instrument sets and the packaging should not exceed 10 kilograms. And in the um, in the event of a bowl, in a bowl pulse set, um, that should not exceed three kilograms. I've weighed trays in hospitals in South Africa of over 19 kilograms. And of course, some of our loan sets are very heavy. And many of the loan set companies are doing their best to comply with the uh, loan set standard and manage the weight of their loan sets. Some of them are still really, really heavy, but a lot of them are trying really hard to get to the right weight. And some of them are a little heavy and therefore it becomes difficult to manage them. 
packaging and sterile barrier systems are manufactured within this guideline. They're manufactured to handle 10 kilograms. They aren't necessarily managed, uh, manufactured to handle 19 kilogram sets. They aren't manufactured to handle trays with holes in them, with bits of wire sticking out, with corners that are rough. They're not designed for that. So it's very important to bear that in mind. Am I using linen for protection because it's the sterile barrier system or because my handling is not great or because my equipment is a little frayed? What are my circumstances? A very important thing to consider. The World Health Organization also says that defects in any fabric will render a wrap ineffective. So whether that's linen or anything, it's going to render it ineffective. If you are using linen, bear in mind, is it resistant to the penetration by microorganisms? Is it germproof? We'll tell you next week. Is it free of holes? Our linen often isn't. Is it free of toxic ingredients? I don't know the answer to that because sometimes our linen is stained and we don't know what that stain is. Is it lint-free or loan free? or low linting, if it's standard cotton linen, then no, it isn't. Is it tamper proof? And of course, can it provide an adequate barrier to particulate matters and fluids? Good question. If you're using standard cotton linen, then this might be what's happening in your CCD and in your operating rooms. As you know, when you damp dust in the morning, um, you will see lots of lint fibers throughout your department. The image on the left is a filter in an automated washer disinfector in one of our um, CCSDs, and that's all of the lint fibers attached to the filter. And on the right is inside a famous heat sealer. So that's the amount of lint that it gathered inside a heat sealer. That's incredible. So you must think of how much lint is actually in our departments. So should we be using linen? Should we be using just standard cotton linen? I'm not talking about linen that's better designed, that is low linting, that is designed for this purpose. I'm really referring to standard cotton. Of course, what is not suitable, and it's important to remember the World Health Organization guidelines, guidelines takes into account um, resource settings that might have constraints, economic constraints, as well as, um, as, well as other areas. And Bear in mind that newspaper, brown paper bags and recycled materials are not good for steam sterilization or any form of sterilization or, a, or an adequate sterile barrier system. Uh, in the olden days, and I don't know if anybody still has the metal drums with holes that can be adjusted, opened and closed. I hope not, but if you are, they're not suitable. just want to chat for a few minutes about this really interesting published paper I came across in the American Journal of Infection Control. So you may very well be familiar with best care always and bundles of care. So bundles of care are resources used by infection control teams that help show important measures for preventing infections. And uh, the best care always focused on uh, trying to reduce infections, but with a focus on surgical site infections, catheters, central lines, ventilation, and antibiotic stewards. So this paper was published in the American Journal of Infection Control by a group of nurses who have, um, using a variety of techniques and methodology and research methodology, identified six areas of bundles of care for prevention of infection that is associated with CCC. And these bundles of care are something that, um, as the CFSA, I'd like to unpack a little more in detail. And should there be something we should be taking into cognizance and with our next update of our standard operating procedures um, for CSSD practices. So they divided them into cleaning. So there are two sections on cleaning. Uh, inspection, pack and prep, sterilization, and storage. And in that particular um, section on prep and packaging, I'm listing the seven things that they identified in this published paper that are important around the prevention of infection relating to our CCSD practices. And in prep and pack, number one, are the professionals using PPE? And this, they refer to mask caps and gloves 
in the prep and pack area. So the use of gloves in the prep and pack area is not something that's commonly done. I have seen a previous paper that talks to the fact of whether we should be wearing gloves while we're compiling sets. Um, I've not seen it in many guidelines or any other guidelines that we should be wearing gloves, but you certainly should be performing hand hygiene before you compile a set. Are you using standardized sterilization barrier system so that you're using the same thing consistently because you want a validated process. Is um, the device being packed um, adequately using the right type of sterile barrier system? Are you using the right number of folds? Are you using the right type of folds? Are you sealing it properly if it's a sealing type thing? And if you're using a sealing machine, is it properly sealed? If it's a sterilization container, are you sealing it properly? Which means, is the gasket there? Have you applied your tamper-proof evidence? If you're using a sealing machine, has the sealing machine been maintained and tested and validated? Can you validate that seal? Is it a proper sealing machine that actually measures the dwell time, the pressure and the temperature all of the time? Or is it that old one where you, you, know, you stand on it with your foot and it's your best guess whether or not it's actually working properly? Have you labeled and identified the packs correctly? And have you included some form of traceability? If you're lucky and you're fancy, you've got a fancy electronic tracking and tracing system. If you're not, you're using an old, um, an old school label on the outside, but where's your traceability? And do you have checklists? Are the checklists in the trays? Do you know that everything was prepared correctly, that everything that was meant to be in the set was in the set? And they also refer to the importance of cleaning and disinfecting the surfaces where you are doing the packing according to an established routine. And of course, who's doing that and when are you doing it? And hopefully you're now not putting um, a new clean pack on a wet surface that you're now trying to you know, uh, create a pack and the surface is wet. But those are very interesting points of, um, of things that I think we need to be talking about in our bundles of care in the CSSD. Next week's webinar, here's a sneak preview, and the images on the left are of sheeting of wrapping materials, so how they're made, in fact, on an SMS, if you can look at the bottom picture on the left. The middle is a test called the Hydrohead test, and we'll talk more about that next time. And on the right is the burst tester, so that's how we test for burst strength um, that it complies with the standard that it's meant to. So what have we covered in today's session? I think we've clearly described what is a sterile barrier system and what it does. We've definitely dealt with the different types of sterile barrier systems, the preformed ones, the ones used in industry and the ones used in our hospital settings. Uh, we've looked at which ones we are meant to use. We've looked at the requirements of them, allowing in the sterilant, uh, providing adequate microbial barrier, and of course, how they should be stored. As normal, we will send you an email to the link of the uh, test questions. If you would like a certificate of attendance, you please need to do the test. Also, we'll send you the link to the recording of this session in a day or two. Please feel free to visit our SAFMED YouTube channel where you will find a variety of videos, also recordings of previous webinars that we have hosted, and that is where we will host the recording of today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today and see you again next week. Same time, same place. Thank you.